Richard Pearson from University College London. Rich is a, a reader in biodiversity at UCL and he's also the new director of the Centre for Biodiversity and Environmental Research. So welcome to the world of responsible grown-ups, Rich. Uh, his talk, Flippancy Aside, is really important. We all know that biodiversity around the globe is declining. Rich's talk is really about answering the question about why we should care about that. Do we have some sort of moral responsibility to deal with this issue, or should more utilitarian values prevail? Uh, to give you a little bit of background about Richard himself, I learned today that he went to the same school as the Director of Science at NHM, a guy called Ian Owens, some small town south of York, I believe. Uh, they've both been socialised since those times, you can uh, be, be confident, so that's a good sign. Um, Rich did his PhD at Oxford before spending several years as a, as a postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And if you've never been there, um, I suggest if you find yourself in New York, that should be one of the places that you go see because it's a truly amazing place to, to visit and I imagine quite a, an interesting place to work too. Um, Rich's work focuses on where you find animals and plants and why they're there, how their distributions change over time and what sort of drives those changes and also as I started at the beginning about why we should all care about that. So I've droned on enough Rich, um, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Pearson. Thank you Ken. Um, so let me dive straight in with this first slide, which is the tree of life. It's one of these big uh, trees that shows the diversity of life um, on the planet. Um, I should emphasize it's really looking at the species level diversity. When we talk about biodiversity, we tend to think about not just species level diversity, but diversity within species, so genetic diversity and diversity um, across whole ecosystems as well, so communities. Of, of, of different species. I should emphasize, I do have a pointer here, that um, you, we are here. So each of these little gray um, uh, bit of writing that you can't see the details of is a species. We are, of course, among the animals. There's got the plants here, protists, bacteria, fungi, etc. So this is what we think about, this is what we mean by biodiversity. What we're really interested in and what I want to focus on for the next half hour or so is kind of our relationship. The relationship of this one rather peculiar animal with the rest of life on Earth. So a quick question for you to start with. How many of you kind of like biodiversity and think we should conserve it? Right, not surprising. Everybody likes biodiversity, right? We all want to conserve it. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a no-brainer. I guess you're not necessarily a cross-section of the population, um, but um, you, know, you, you ask a thousand people and you get a thousand of the same answers. If I were to ask each of you a subtly different question, which would be, why should we conserve biodiversity? Um, then we'd probably get a different set of answers. We'd get each of you coming up with a set of, of different reasons that you would prioritize um, in different ways. And if I were to go a step further and ask a, a slightly more difficult question that kind of pits biodiversity conservation against other things that you're probably in favor of, say, should we allow people to cut down trees and hunt in a forest that's home to endangered species, say an endangered bird, but if that person that's doing the hunting, if, if their livelihood, their ability to feed their children depends on it, then we have a more difficult kind of question to address. So we've got to pit these, we've got to place how we want to conserve biodiversity and what we favor about diversity against a whole suite of other things that we're interested in. So the situation becomes less clear when we dig into it. And what I want to do today is just to look a little bit deeper and have us think a, a little bit more about really what are our reasons for conserving biodiversity and nature in general. So I'm essentially a conservation biologist. One of the areas that I work in is this field of conservation biology, which we tend to refer to as a crisis discipline. And I'm going to briefly outline in a moment why that's so. But I want to try and send you away in a few minutes' time, um, at least cautiously optimistic. 
So I'm going to suggest that this is a solvable problem, but I'm also going to suggest that in order to solve it, we really need to acknowledge that it's human interests that lie at the centre of why we should conserve biodiversity. So this is one way of, 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 there's a lot of detail on here, I just want to pick out the big picture, but this is one way of looking at data from the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the red list that I'm sure um, most of you will have, will have heard about, a way of assessing whether spe species are threatened or not based on a, a whole set of criteria about how the populations are declining, how the geographic ranges are declining or not. Um, and what, what we've got here then are, um, for the three best known groups, so the birds, the mammals, uh, and the amphibians, um, uh, each of these little symbols represents 100 species, and of course the ones in red are the ones that we consider to be threatened according to, to these criteria of, of the red list. So the proportions, as you'll see, become fairly high. So maybe 13 or so percent of, of birds that have been assessed, um, uh, around a quarter of, of, of mammals and upwards of 40% of amphibians we think are really threatened with extinction over the coming decade. So overall, there are about 20,000 or so species of animals and plants around the world that are considered at high risk of extinction in the wild. Now, of course, we know from the fossil record that mass extinction has previously occurred about, well, five times in the last 540 million years. The last one occurred about 65 million years ago. Of course, that's what wiped out the dinosaurs. But this current kind of rate of extinction that we're seeing puts us on course for a sixth mass extinction. So this is something that, you know, you, you, you'll see in the media, and, and these, are, these are the headline numbers that make us think um, that biodiversity is in crisis. Another way to look at this, and this, this, this is data looking at populations now rather than at the species level, this is from the Living Planet report that, that is, um, uh, comes out of, of, it's published by WWF, and a lot of the work behind that is, is done here at the Zoological Society in London, particularly through the Institute of, of, of Zoology. Um, they work with the Living Planet Index. It's based on about 14,000 populations that have been well studied for over 3,500 vertebrate species. It's basically a measure of average change in uh, population abundance um, over time. And of course, what we see is this decline. If you pin the index at 1 in 1970, there's been a decline of, of, of well over half, so uh, it's about 58% up to 2012 in, in, decline, you know, in, in population sizes for these vertebrates over those few decades. So this is all just background to say, essentially, this is why we as conservation biologists look at the numbers, look at the data. Our best understanding is that we have a, an issue here, and this is why you'll hear about sixth mass extinction and a biodiversity crisis. So what are the causes of these biodiversity losses? What are the drivers? So this is a, a, a nice um, figure, again, a very simple graph just showing it's an aggregation of different indicators that show what are happening to the main threats to biodiversity. So this is things like, of course, habitat fragmentation and deforestation, pollution, so nitrogen deposition. Uh, we all hear a lot about plastics in the environment these days. Climate change, um, over-exploitation, um, so fisheries in this picture. Um, invasive species, this is the brown tree snake um, that invaded Guam um, it, over the last few decades and, and has caused a lot of damage to local biodiversity there. So in general, what we see is that the pressures across all these different pressures are vastly um, increasing. And actually, this is what's led to another of the kind of catchphrases that, you will, that you'll see in the media and, and the like of, of the Anthropocene. This is the kind of idea of naming a new geological epoch. This is the age that's dominated by, by human impact. And the statistics around this are things like half of all uh, accessible fresh water on the planet is used by humans. Uh, about 30 to 50 percent or so of um, the planet's land surface is in some way um, exploited by humans. So we, we, we see the pressures on biodiversity within the context of this, this broader um, idea of the Anthropocene. The pressures are driving these biodiversity declines. So that's the kind of classic story that, that we're faced with in this field, and it's, it's, it's often seen as a quite, quite depressing one, and rightly so. 
But let's be sure to place this within the context of human progress. This is something that I think um, we, we often talk about the Anthropocene as being quite negative. We kind of view you know, the pressures on the earth as, as humans, as the despoilers of, of, of the earth, without placing this in the context of the really quite phenomenal progress that we've seen in terms of human well-being. So these are data um, in terms of average life expectancy globally and then split by, by um, different continents. And of course, back since the 1700s up to the present day, the life expectancy across the planet has massively um, increased. Similar kinds of things in terms of percentage of the world population that's in extreme poverty has plummeted over a similar kind of time scale. And we can plot similar things for things like deaths from infectious diseases, malnutrition, um, literacy. So overall, we've got to place the Anthropocene, the, the, the pressures on biodiversity, within this, um, the, the, these, these composite measures that show that overall human progress um, has been really quite, clearly quite positive in many, by many um, measures. So what we kind of end up with is a bit of a divide between um, human progress um, and um, environmental degradation. And we often, I think, too often see this as, as, a, as, as a divide that pits one, pits human interests against environmental um, interests. So what I want to kind of try and show today and think through is that really environmental protection and human interests need not and they really cannot be seen as at odds with one, of, one another. Again, this biodiversity crisis, I think, can be a solvable problem. We've made huge strides in terms of all these other kinds of measures of, of, of human well-being. And what we need to do is see the biodiversity crisis as, as another problem um, that we've got to solve. And what I want to argue is that we want to solve it for, for our own benefit. So what I'm going to do over the next uh, few minutes is really explore why we value nature. Really, what are the reasons for conserving biodiversity and which are those ones that should be at the forefront of our kind of ethics, our environmental philosophy um, over the coming decades. So let's take a bit of a narrative approach to start with um, and look at how kind of human views of nature and conservation have changed over the last few um, decades. So this is a narrative, it's a very simplified um, narrative that my colleague at, at UCL, George, Georgina Mace, put forward um, a few years ago, but it gets us thinking. So what you see, of course, are moving through the, from the seven, uh, 60s and 70s through to the present day, present day, and with these various framings. So the first framing that we think about is kind of nature for itself. This is ideas of wilderness and protected areas. Think of Aldo Leopold's land ethic. Wilderness not as for hunting and recreation, but as, as, as a place to be preserved for what Aldo Leopold says was for the integrity, the stability, the beauty of the biotic community. Then if you think um, another framing that we, we would move on to would be kind of nature despite people. So this is threats to species, the kind of things that I've just talked about, habitat loss, pollution, and really stemming in large part from people's work like Rachel Carson and, and, and her book on Silent Spring that was so um, influential, and then leading into concepts such as Arne Ness's deep ecology, which promotes the inherent or intrinsic value of, 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 of nature and of biodiversity regardless of, of, of human use. Then what we've seen really moving through since the millennium through um, issues such as, or, or influential reports such as the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment um, and the, the TEAB, the, the um, uh, study on the, the economics of biodiversity and, and, and ecosystems that really talked about, they focused on the benefits that humans gain from ecosystems. And we have this other framing which we can tend to talk about as nature for people. So this is when nature is, is providing services um, for humans. Um, and notice, I should, I should just notice on, on this slide that what we're not saying is that these have replaced each other. These are very much um, uh, kind of framings that, that, that exist to the current day all, all in parallel. And that's what Georgina was trying to show in the bottom left as, 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 as we're looking at it here. These are different framings that, that, that exist today. And this people and nature framing, benefits for nature and for people, is, is really, um, it's important today. It's quite dominant today. So here's just one example. Here's Michael Gove from the 25-year um, plan to improve the environment here in the UK, um, saying that um, 
we need to respect nature's intrinsic value, the value of all life. It's critical to our mission. But we also draw from the planet all the raw materials we need to live, food, water, air, and energy. So protecting the environment, as this plan lays out, is about more than just respecting nature. Again, this is people and nature. This is let's respect nature for its intrinsic worth, but let's also respect all the services that we um, get from nature. Of course, this particular statement is wrapped up in the discussions about post-Brexit environmental pol policies and the proposals that farmers would um, receive payments for public goods. But you see similar kind of dual framings of why we should conserve nature in, in, in lots of different um, policy documents all around the world. So just to summarize the different ways that we tend to value um, biodiversity, and there's a lot of disagreement over terminology, and I'm simplifying a lot of subcategories that, that people will refer to, but essentially we tend to refer to utilitarian value, the uses that humans derive from nature, or intrinsic value, this perceived value of nature irrespective of, of, of human interests. So let's, what I want to do is spend a few minutes kind of digging into and critiquing a little bit each of these. So for those of us based at UCL, this um, um, idea of utilitarian value is very meaningful because um, utilitarianism was one of the um, kind of moral philosophies that was advocated by Jeremy Bentham, who's often regarded as, as the kind of spiritual founder of UCL, and those that visit the South Cloisters at UCL will see his um, stuffed skeleton on display. Um, if you visit right now, he's actually on tour in, in New York, um, so you can't see him over the summer, but he will be back. Um, if you visit now, you won't actually see his head. His head was removed um, um, because the preservation of his head didn't work particularly well. It's rather gruesome. Um, so that's not on display, but Jeremy Bentham, um, on display in the South Cloisters, um, very much associated with, with UCL. And utilitarian, utilitarianism, as, as a general ethic, holds that the best action is the one that maximizes utility, where utility is essentially most often defined in terms of, of, of the well-being of people. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of, of utilitarianism here. Any undergraduate philosophy textbook will lay out the pros and cons. But for our purposes, when we refer to utilitarian value in terms of biodiversity, we're referring to the many uses that we as humans derive from biodiversity. And that's because biodiversity underpins many, many different ecosystem services. And, and here's just a picture of a, of a, of a hoverfly, hoverfly pollinating a flower. Some brief, you know, examples, there's a lot written on ecosystem services that are provided, but things like pollination, so wild pollinators are, of course, um, important for, for, for crops. Um, genetic diversity of wild crops is important for, for, for improvement of crop strains, and, of course, we just get a lot of um, enjoyment and recreational value from biodiversity. So there are all these kind of services that, again, there's, you know, whole talks about just what different services we get. Um, I'll include there what we might term kind of indirect um, use values, which are kind of anthropocentric, they're u utilitarian, um, but they're, they're things that we value even though there might not be a direct use. So um, things like we, we tend to gain just satisfaction from knowing that tigers, polar bears, gorillas continue to exist and that they can be kind of bequeathed to, to, to future generations, maybe for future use, even though there isn't a direct use we still gain value as humans from knowing that, that, that biodiversity exists and, and, and can be passed on to future generations. So there are all these kind of u ecosystem services um, that, that we make use of. And this idea of nature for people or, or utilitarian value is, is often associated with monetization, quantification of the benefits that we get. For example, it's been estimated that just pollination... Um, uh, of, 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 of crops globally, so the global economic value of crop pollination by animals is, is in the order of $200 billion um, each year. So we can, with great uncertainty, start putting economic values on, um, on biodiversity. And the arguments for quantifying the benefits um, uh, is basically along the lines of cost-benefit analysis. If, if we don't quantify the benefits, then they tend to be ignored when we're a society and, and making um, different arguments for and against 
um, different, different, say, land uses. So they're, they're kind of considered public goods. They're available to everyone for free. And if we don't put a, 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 a value on them, then they can be excluded. So essentially, the true value, the economic value, is ignored if we don't quantify it. So that, that's the kind of utilitarian arg argument for trying to quantify the benefits. But let's think a little bit about intrinsic value again, which is this, this idea of, of, of value irrespective of, of the value um, to, to humans. So to many people, if, if we ask, you know, you might say that this is the real reason we should conserve biodiversity. This is the kind of nature for itself viewpoint. Other species have a right to share the planet regardless of our uses. And you might even say, you know, it's a moral imperative in the same way that we shouldn't commit murder, we shouldn't sell human organs, we, should, we simply morally shouldn't um, be, be harming biodiversity. So this, this kind of intrinsic value, nature for itself I ideology tends to reject monetization because putting a monetary value on nature um, kind of implies that it can be destroyed for the right price. You're putting a price on it, which means if you pay that price, you can destroy it. It's kind of summed up nicely in this um, quote from, from The Guardian. It, it was part of a, a George Monbiot um, article from, from a few years ago. Um, can you put a price on the beauty of the natural world? Those who reduce nature to a column of figures, those who quantify the benefits, just play to an engender um, that ignores its inherent value. You can't do this because you're just, in effect, putting nature up for a price. And I think that there's... There's a lot to be said for this argument. Um, there really is a huge risk in using kind of free markets and quantification of economic benefits to manage biodiversity. Um, it surely might well be inappropriate to say, put a monetary value on the existence of tigers. But what we need to be clear about is that doesn't necessarily mean that the economic value of, say, pollinators shouldn't be used to justify their quantification. So quantifying the value of something doesn't necessarily mean we're creating an economic market for it. There are a lot of non-market valuation techniques that, that uh, economists that we work with um, are, are really you know, uh, on top of that can be used to support conservation. And we, wh what I'm really saying is that we do need to be very clever and cautious here in combining monetary valuation with just tight regulations that recognize intrinsic value and recognize the monetary value of ecosystem services. So we undoubtedly need to be wary of utilitarian value, economic valuation of biodiversity. But let me be a bit more critical and give some reasons why I would argue um, that the concept of intrinsic value is kind of inherently um, problematic. The first of those is that it really pits human well-being against the well-being of nature. So it sets, it sets apart the interests of, of, of nature as kind of separate from or conflicting with the interests of humans. Think back to um, what I was talking about a, a few minutes ago. So we end up with this kind of perception that nature conservation is, is at odds with human interests and environmentalists value nature above human needs. So this is just a, a, a bumper sticker that um, loggers are, are an endangered species too. This is from a few years ago, this long-running friction in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S., over the protection of northern spotted owls that were protected under the Endangered Species Act and kind of pitted the local logging communities against environmentalists. Because the, 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 localists, the, the local loggers' view was, and quite understandably, that, that we were protecting owls at the expense of their livelihoods. So it's very much seen as pitting human interests against the interests of the intrinsic value of a particular owl because that, that species was, was endangered. So we kind of end up with another framing, this idea of kind of people versus nature, that I think is antagonistic um, and isn't going to help us to actually get at solving this biodiversity crisis. Another thing to say is that values are constructed by humans. So can values really be dis defined outside human preferences. If the value isn't to humans, then who or what is it actually to? Who is this intrinsic value? Who is it to? So one answer is, is, tends to be that, it, well, it's to biodiversity itself. 
But what does that actually mean? Do tigers or bees or earthworms actually kind of value, see value in their species in the same way that we see value in humans? Probably not, but these are big, very difficult questions to address when we pin the intrinsic value of nature as being the most important reason that we should value nature. So if we're not defining intrinsic value, well, if we're going to define intrinsic value outside human interest, the other approach is to infer some sort of higher being, which is why I have a picture of the Pope up here from his encyclical letter from 2015, which is, which is very informative on care for our common home. But because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence. We have no such right. So the reason for conserving biodiversity in this kind of framing of intrinsic value is because God, or some equivalent, says it's right not to do so. But for the growing proportion of the planet's population that take what you might say as an enlightened or non-religious viewpoint, for me as a scientist, that's kind of a deeply unsatisfactory um, reason. Which is why, again, I come back to this idea of being quite critical of the idea of intrinsic value. I think we need to favour a kind of more enlightened conservation ethic, enlightened in the sense that it doesn't rely on these kind of superstitious ideas about morality being something aside from human interest. We need to acknowledge that it's our human interests that are at stake here. So I've tried to dig a little bit, and there's a lot to be said and, and, and a lot of arguing, I'm sure, about some of uh, the concepts behind what, really why we conserve biodiversity. But I promised, um, having shown you that biodiversity is in crisis, I, I promised to send you away um, a little bit optimistic. So let me finish with a few reasons why I think that this might be a solvable problem. Some of the context for this, then, is this, um, these sustainable development goals, um, which were adopted in, in 2015 by the, the, the United Nations. Um, they have a, a whole bunch of, 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 of aims related to reducing hunger, reducing poverty, um, providing education, gender equality, and the like. But some of them are quite specifically of interest to us as biodiversity scientists. So, Target 15.5, for example, is to take urgent and significant action to reduce the degradation of natural habitats, halt the loss of biodiversity, and, and, and prevent the extinction of threatened species. Now, there's been a lot of debate about the SDGs, and many people have kind of questioned whether these big, lofty ambitions um, or aspirations can really be turned into realistic policies and results. In fact, an article in, in The Lancet dismissed these as the SDGs in general is nothing more than fairy tales. So let's, let me finish by just asking, is this idea of halting biodiversity loss a fairy tale? Um, and let's look at some kind of reasons to be optimistic, some key global trends that I think should make us optimistic. And, and a key underlying trend here that we usually think of is, is, is population growth. So we've all, um, you know, um, seen over our lifetimes, population growth has been incredible growth over the past few centuries, from about 1 billion humans in 1800 to more than 7 billion humans to net today. So our inclination is to expect runaway population growth um, leading to environmental and human catastrophe. This is kind of Paul Ehrlich's idea of the population bomb from a few years ago. But the fact is, if you look at the numbers, and this has been discussed a lot, um, that the rate of population growth has actually been falling. So the rate of population growth has been falling, reason being basically because birth rates and death rates have dropped as, as people and, and countries have got wealthier and better educated. And there's now broad agreement among demographers, so what you're seeing on the right here are, are scenarios of, of population growth over the, 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 the coming century, um, under different scenarios called shared soci socioeconomic pathways. But there's a general broad agreement that we're probably looking at stabilizing the world population around the year 2100, most likely around 8 to 10 or so billion people, might be as low as 6, might be as high as 12. But this is important because it means that the planet doesn't need to sustain an ever-growing, exponentially you know, growing population. So there's some reason to think that the underlying factors here with a window of opportunity could lead us to some stabilized population that we need to, to support and, and alongside biodiversity. Other reasons for hope are essentially that we're really seeing accelerating responses um, to this biodiversity crisis. 
firstly, there's been real progress in the policy arena. So, for example, there are about 180, 184 out of 196 parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is kind of the big um, international convention um, that, uh, that, that, that's been, that you know, um, countries are signed up to for biodiversity conservation. So the vast majority of those countries have developed what we refer to as national biodiversity strategies and action plans. So these are within country strategies um, to set out actions such as promoting laws and providing funds to help achieve the Convention's goals. And there are other signs such as the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, a kind of IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and IPCC for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So there's big international policy uh, agendas to start addressing this. And one way that that's kind of turning into at least some action, here's a, here's a plot of um, uh, uh, protected areas in million kilometer, millions of kilometers since the 1920s for um, terrestrial in, in green and, and, and marine in blue. And what we see is, you know, the amount of land across the planet that's being protected is increasing. Of course, big debates about how well those protected areas are actually functioning, but this is another good sign that we're heading in the right direction. And another reason to be kind of optimistic is a kind of mainstreaming of biodiversity and this idea of natural capital in business and economics, as I've kind of argued, is really what we need to be thinking about in terms of quantifying the benefits um, in, in, in the talk today. And we're really seeing this. So, for example, as the Natural Capital Coalition, um, which involves many of the really big players, Coca-Cola, Deloitte, um, in business, in accountancy, in consulting, that are signed up to developing a case for valuing natural capital, ecosystems, biodiversity, in their accounting system, so how the businesses are functioning. The financial industry, um, as well, the UN has a set of principles for responsible investment, which commit investors... Um, they sign up and they commit to act in accordance with conventions such as the Convention on Biological Diversity. This, these principles have around 1,400 signatories who manage assets with a combined uh, value of about 59 trillion US dollars. So this is something, these are issues that are increasingly being, if you like, mainstreamed and there are some positive changes that have come to the fore in the past few decades. And those policies, those um, actions are resulting in some positive, if you like, conservation success stories um, that just illustrate how we can turn things around for biodiversity. So just to finish with a, a couple of examples, and there are, there are a lot of these. So um, the EU Birds and Habitats Directive uh, directives um, have meant that there's been a real upsurge in large carnivores right across Europe, uh, in, in many of the European regions, where in areas that they, they've been absent for decades. So the Iberian lynx is one such example. There are only about 52 mature individuals in the wild in um, the year 2002, but the populations have really, really been bolstered over the last um, few years, the last decade or so. And in the oceans, there's an example of the Guadalupe fur seal, which twice in the past we thought had gone extinct, um, and it's making a big comeback. More generally, there's an overall positive trend. This is data from, again, the Living Planet Index. I showed the overall, the Living Planet report, I showed the overall trend um, a few minutes ago. It is negative, but across 1,000 birds and mammals in Europe, in the Northern Hemisphere at least, the trends are positive. So there are positive trends, there are conservation success stories. Of course, they're only scattered examples at the moment, and I, I've shown that you know, the overall trends are declining, but there is increasing recon recognition within the kind of area that, that, that I work in and, and colleagues work in, um, that conservation is working, and there are plenty of examples to back that up. Um, I'd say there's a general shift from kind of pessimism to optimism. For those of you who are a bit more savvy with social media than I am, check out this, ha this hashtag that's been pushed by Smithsonian Institution and Cambridge Conservation Initiatives um, and others who are really leading this, where conservation scientists and practitioners around the world are sharing conservation success stories. This isn't a kind of, don't worry, it'll be all right type of, of optimism. This is a kind of, with a big effort, we can actually solve this problem 
kind of um, optimism. And what I've tried to argue today is that we can solve this, um, we can be on track to solve this, but I really think that what we need to do is acknowledge that it's our own human interests that are at stake um, if we're going to actually turn things around. And let me just finally acknowledge support um, from the uh, UCL, the, the Grand Challenges um, initiative, which is one of the ways that UCL is kind of exploring solutions to some of these big societal questions about global health, about sustainable cities, um, justice and equality, um, cultural understanding and the like. And I, I guess what I'm saying is that conserving biodiversity is one of these kind of big, grand challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, um, the format, if you don't know, it's for the two talks to take place, and there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. So if you've got a burning question for Rich, don't lose it while you listen to the next talk. Now, the next talk, I need to read this out. Stephen Price is going to take us down a, a scale, and he's, he's written an introduction for his own talk, which, which wouldn't do justice if I didn't read it out. So here it comes. Hollywood loves plagues that drive humans to the brink of extinction while governments fret about disease threats to public health and economic interests. Wildlife diseases receive less attention but are also of serious concern. In this lecture you will learn about a horrible viral disease affecting frogs that live near your homes. It is a case study that will give you insight into the most interesting and troubling aspects of infectious disease emergence. Devastation of host populations weapons used to wage war, and how the environment and human behaviour can influence outcomes. Big stuff. So, Stephen Price, I, I, I really love this, who described his motivations for getting interested in zoology as Desmond Morris's naked ape and, and a spell cleaning up penguins caught in an oil slick. Um, I have no idea why those two things go together in that way, but I'm sure... Um, Stephen can explain a little bit more uh, about his science background and the work he's been doing while he's been a postdoc and a PhD student at QMUL and at ZSL and at UCL, so very much part of the kind of London Science Partnership and is the title of his talk, Stephen. And over to you, so ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Bryce. Thanks, Ken. Um, it's a real honour to be here to present some of my research to you. Um, and Richard sort of set my talk up in one way when he showed early on uh, that four, more than 40% of amphibian species are threatened. And so I'm going to be talking today about one threat to amphibians, which is infectious disease. Um, these are a couple of the main places that I share my work. Um, principally my website, which is toinfectious.wordpress.com. And if you're interested in finding out more after the talk, then I encourage you to go there. And I'll post a link to my slides, should you want to revisit any of the, the material that I present today. So, as Ken said, I'm, I'm a disease ecologist, and I've been involved in research at ZSL for almost nine years, and have been working at UCL for nearly five years. So I said I was a disease ecologist, and that's because I'm interested in questions which focus on the ecology and e evolution of uh, disease-causing agents or pathogens and their hosts. So those are questions such as, as these, what makes a, a pathogen bad or a parasite bad? How do pathogens spread? Um, how do pathogens that infect one host differ from those that can infect many? And what other factors are going on around disease events that affect the outcome? It also means that my work is quite varied. I, I spend some time out in the field monitoring and sampling amphibian populations. I spend time in the lab um, where I can be found growing viruses or trying to isolate viral DNA from dead amphibians and then trying to decode that DNA. 
And then I spend time in the office at the computer analyzing the data that I generate. And much of my research has focused on this viral disease of amphibians, which is called ranavirus disease. This means it has involved these two main characters, frogs and viruses. And although the disease can be horrible, I think it's a fantastic system to work on. And I'll spend the rest of my talk trying to ensure that you leave feeling the same way. I'll often talk about frogs, but I've also work quite a lot on these amazing characters, the salamanders, which in include our beautiful UK newts. And I think amphibians are a, a really fantastic species group to work on because they're amazingly diverse in their colours, shapes and their ways of life. And they occur almost everywhere. So they're found on all continents except for Antarctica. And on this map, the white regions are showing places where there were no amphibians known at the time. In contrast, the red regions are showing places where you've got this phenomenal array of amphibian diversity. And as a direct consequence of this beauty, diversity, and their global distribution, they're also animals that are really accessible to humans. And so I'd like to do a quick straw poll. So if you can, please all raise your hands. And so if you can remember a time in your life where you were doing something like this, collecting frog spawn or netting tadpoles or just happily observing adult frogs, if you can keep your hands raised. If you can't remember, if you don't have such a memory, then you can lower your hands. Okay, fantastic. You can all put your hands down. So there's a really sizable majority of people in this room who have fond memories of an interaction with amphibians. And for me, it's this that makes amphibians truly unique organisms to work on. Because wherever people live, even if you live in the largest city, there's opportunity to go and witness this really remarkable um, natural event that's metamorphosis in amphibians. And through that, to connect very strongly with the natural world. Um, on the other side of my study system, um, it's the viruses. And it's a bit harder to, for me to present such a dazzling montage of wonderful images of viruses. And that's because they're quite hard to see, because they're so very, very small. So the next thing I want you to do for me is to picture a, a single grain of salt on the end of your finger. Um, I work on a group of viruses which are called large DNA viruses on account of their huge size and the type of molecule that encodes their genetic information. Nevertheless, in spite of this, you could fit 27 billion individual vira virus particles into that single grain of salt that I ask you to, to visualize. So you can see that the large in the, in the name is really a relative term um, on account of their large size relative to other viruses. They're very small. And then billions might also be the unit if we think about the, the number of years that viruses have, have been around on our planet. So we know that viruses, almost certainly the ancestors of some viruses, go back to the very origins of life on our Earth. And some think even earlier than that. Um, they're truly fascinating things to study. So now that I've given you some background to the cast, I'll get on with telling you more of, of, of the science. And I've, my title is a big hint that I sometimes see this as a war between viruses and their, their hosts. And today I'm going to show you the nature of, of this war and how the impacts can be very severe. I'll demonstrate what's going on around the interaction between a virus and its host that can influence the outcome. And um, I'll introduce you to some of the, the weaponry that's used on both, both sides of this battle. And finally, I'll talk about how human behavior can have an impact on wildlife disease. So firstly, I'm going to show you the disease. And I'm going to show you some 
uh, photographs that you might find unpleasant. So just as a warning, it took me several years to get used to seeing these, these types of images, but I've come to realize that they're a really important um, element of understanding the impact of, of disease. So Q photos. Ranaviruses cause, can cause a fatal disease and it can be quite gruesome. Um, and it's typified by this kind of systemic hemorrhaging, which means that animals can bleed from almost any or all of their organs. And sometimes you get this mind-boggling mind ulceration. Sorry. Uh, so this is an animal that's still alive with a, a big ulcer. And this, you also see this kind of extreme limb breakdown in some cases. So next we'll look at the impacts of this viral disease. And we've known about ranavirus disease in the UK for more than 25 years now. And most of what we know has come from studying garden ponds, um, where we know that the disease has had a, a major impact. So back in 2008, a group of researchers from ZSL looked at ponds where the owners had been, been observing disease outbreaks every year or two for the previous decade. And as a comparison, uh, they looked at a set of ponds where no, no disease had ever been seen. And I'll use these images throughout to, to show places where there is disease and places where there isn't. In all cases, the pond owners recorded estimates of the frog population size at each of two time points, so around 1996 and then again in 2008. Of course, no two ponds are the same in terms of their size or the suitability for frogs. And so there will be variation between ponds in the number of frogs that you find, find there. And this means that our data, data will fall in different places along these axes, which show the number of frogs at the two different time points. So in 1996 along the bottom and then 2008 along the side. And when we combine the data from a set of ponds, we can summarize it as a trend line. And I'm showing here the one-to-one -one line, which is indicative of no change in the number of frogs in a pond. So if we've got 50 frogs in 1996, and then 50 frogs in 2008, you're falling on this one-to-one -one line showing no change. 100 in 1996, 100 in 1998, again, you're on the one-to-one on the -one line. So if our trend falls below this one-to-one -one line, it's indicative that there's been something driving declines in these frog populations. And if our trend falls above this one-to-one -one line, then the frog populations have actually been growing in size. So what was found? Well, the green line here is the trend at sites without any observations of viral disease. So in the absence of disease, this is the, the trend that we see in frog population size over that decade. And if we put the one-to-one -one line back for reference, then you can see that the trend is almost identical. So there's been nothing generally going on that's been causing a change in, in frog populations. <coughs> now, the red line is the trend at sites where there's been these repeated outbreaks of disease. And you can see here that the pattern is very different. So again, we've got the one-to-one -one line in there for reference. And the shallow this, shallowness of this line really shows the impact of, of the viral disease on these frog populations. So if you've got 100 frogs in uh, 1996, then typically you were finding 20 frogs by 2008. So a really serious collapse in the frog numbers. And so what we've varied here between the two sets of ponds, we've consistently varied the presence of this viral disease and so we can assume that it's the virus that, that has been causing these collapses in frog numbers. I'm going to take you a bit farther away now to Spain, to the Picos de Europa National Park. And this contrasts, contrasts quite a bit with the highly managed setting where we, where we were just in the garden ponds. This is a beautiful wilderness area um, in the north of Spain with high mountains, vultures, bears, and some fantastic flora. And I've been lucky enough to work here. 
But of course, the main reason that I've been going there is disease. And it's a place where we've been seeing massive amphibian die-offs. Here, I've blown up a map of the park. And I've marked some of the places where we've been monitoring the amphibian populations. In 2005, there was a big die-off of amphibians at this site up here, marked Aliva. Um, and after that, my colleague, Jaime Bosch, implemented a program of monitoring at many of these sites marked around the park. And so with the help of the rangers, there were annual counts of the number of amphibians. And soon after this initial outbreak in 2005, we started to see amphibians dying at, at other sites. And so I've marked here this site, Yorotha, where all six of the amphibian species that are common in this region are present at the site, and all six have been involved in these mass mortality events. And I'm going to show you the massive impact of ranavirus in this region. And we'll just focus on one species initially. It's this toad, the common midwife toad, which is a wonderful toad where the males carry the eggs around on their backs until they're ready to hatch when they take them down and deposit them in the water. And this graph shows counts of tadpoles over time at this pond, Yorotha, that I picked out previously. And so we've got the year along the bottom here and then the count of tadpoles of this common midwife toad along the side. And we can see a really big change starting from about 1,500 tadpoles in the pond in, in two, 2007. And by 2010, there were almost no tadpoles to be counted. If we contrast that with a site where there's been no viral disease, this blue flat line going across summarizes the trend in the number of tadpoles at this site. And um, what we see there is a very stable count across years. And this pattern of collapse in the presence of the viral disease and no clear pattern or no change in the absence of the viral disease was replicated at other sites in the park. We also saw the same pattern in other species that we're able to monitor in the same way. So the alpine newt here and the common toad. So I'm sure, sure now you'll agree that the impacts of this disease can be very severe. And I've shown you this effect in two very different settings. But things are a little bit more complicated than I've shown you so far. And I'll demonstrate now how the environment can influence the interaction between a pathogen and its host. I'm going to use a couple of specific examples, the first of which is temperature. My research has really benefited from access to a flagship citizen science project known as the Frog Mortality Project. This project has collated thousands of records of frogs dying over more than two decades. And I've been using them to characterize what goes on around the time of disease outbreaks. So if we look at how temperature affects the occurrence of disease outbreaks, we find that there's a, a big difference between 10 degrees Celsius and 20 degrees. At 10 degrees Celsius, there are a few disease incidents. So we low down here. Um, but at 20 degrees Celsius, the rate of disease incidents is much higher. And there's a kind of tipping point around 16 degrees um, where we move from few, few outbreaks to to many. Not only that, but disease incidents appear to be much more severe when the weather is warm. So this graph includes incidents of frog deaths from all causes, but they're grouped into deaths due to ranavirus disease and then deaths from any other factors. So ranavirus is shown in, with the orange line and then other factors shown in this line that's coming through blue for you. Um, and so these boxes around the lines just capture some of the variation that we see in a large data set. But what you can see is that regardless of the cause of disease, as the temperature increases along the bottom there, 
the severity of these outbreaks, so the proportion of the animals in the population that are dying gets worse. Um, but for the ranavirus incidence, the orange line, this effect of temperature is m much, much bigger. So we start off lower down than the blue line, and we end up higher. So the gradient of this line is really showing that there's a strong effect of temperature. And then we saw over here that when it's cool, there are still some disease outbreaks. But now we're finding that even then, when those few outbreaks are happening, the effect is, is nowhere near as severe. So a low proportion of the, the frogs in the population are dying. And what's really, what's really great is that we, we've been able to bring some of these viruses into the lab and to grow them in bottles. Um, and this has allowed us to re really test whether the patterns that we're seeing in the wild can be replicated in this kind of controlled setting. So we can grow the viruses in bottles where the infections happen normally in, in fish cell lines in our lab. And we're looking for this kind of thing. So this is a lawn of cells growing on the surface of the bottle. And these areas are, uh, are places where the cells have died following infection with the virus and created clearings in this, in this cell lawn. And so when we vary temperature in this controlled setting, temperature increasing along the bottom here, and then viral growth measured along the side of this plot, we can see that virus growth increases with increasing temperature. And with this knowledge, we wondered how climate change might affect disease, and the prospects do not look great. Um, so by 2070, under a high emissions scenario, we can expect the territory for suit that, that is suitable for disease outbreaks to increase in both space and time. And I'm showing this suitable territory in red on these maps. And so you can see for May, where previously Scotland and the north of England has been unsuitable territory based on temperature for these disease outbreaks, or at least severe disease outbreaks, by 2070, we're seeing it start to become suitable. And then we're also seeing this increase in the disease season. So where we've previously seen no, no severe outbreaks of disease in March and April, in the future we, we might expect that we will start to see disease there. And this is important because in the UK we normally only see disease in adult frogs. Um, but we know from lab studies that tadpoles are susceptible. And our findings about the effect of temperature suggest that suggests strongly that this is purely a matter of timing. So the young froglets have already moved away from the pond by the time the environmental conditions become suitable for disease outbreaks. So if we're starting to see uh, the conditions become suitable in March and April when the tadpoles are still in the pond, this might affect the, the frog population's ability to persist in the face of disease by replacing the adults that are dying with, with tadpoles. It's not all doom and gloom, though. Uh, we also found that the presence of lots of shading around ponds reduced the severity of outbreaks. So this uncovers an area for future research. Maybe if the frogs have opportunities to regulate their temperatures through their behavior, they'll be better able to tolerate infection. And if so, then this points to possible action that can be taken to mitigate the effects of disease. Another feature of the environment that can affect disease outcomes is contamination by pollutants. And I've been involved in some research with a US lab which has been looking at the chemical pollutants generated by fracking to see how this affects disease in tadpoles. And we've seen that on their own, these chemicals, in the absence of any virus, these chemicals can be toxic for, to tadpoles. So this is showing survival of amphibians through time. And um, in the absence of the chemicals, we expect all the animals to survive. But when you add increasing con concentrations of the chemical, the, the amphibians are dying. And then in the presence of the virus and the chemicals, we're going to get some death now in all our treatments. So even in, in the absence of the chemicals, some of the tadpoles are starting to die. So that's this top line. But there's a significant effect 
of increasing chemical concentration on the survival of these tadpoles that are fighting these ranavirus infections. So down here, the amphibians are doing much worse. And this increased mortality is accompanied by higher levels of virus in their tissues. So here, the animals experience the highest, level, highest concentrations of chemicals, also have the highest levels of virus. And here we get a suggestion of why this might be. So this plot shows an immune gene uh, and how much is being called on by the, by the animal to fight infection. And when we've got no fracking chemicals, the animals are calling on this, this immune gene quite a lot. And then in the, in the presence of even very low concentrations of the chemicals, there's a lower use of this gene, and, which might be compromising the animal's ability to, to fight infection, excuse me. In the case of the pollution, we saw that immunity might be compromised, and this leads me nicely onto my next topic, which is the weaponry used by both the frogs and the ranaviruses to try and get the upper hand. Um, for frogs, I've already shown that an immune response can be important, and we know that at least some amphibian species can mount sophisticated immune responses involving specialized cells and classical inflammatory responses. Amphibians also have molecules in their skin which act against microbes and some of these have been shown to inactivate ranavirus. And then we're just starting to learn about another type of response to infection uh, and this one might be of interest to anyone who's thought about or used probiotic supplements. And so I've been working with some ZSL colleagues who set up two types of frog enclosure. The top one here is what we call a simple enclosure. It's clean, containing clean gravel and water with nothing, nothing allowed to decompose inside the enclosure. And then the bottom one is a more complex enclosure with dirt on the ground and then leaf litter and surplus food decomposing in the, in the enclosure. And groups of frogs went into the two types of enclosure and were maintained there for a while. And then after a while, we swabbed the frogs, which basically means we got a cotton wool bud and rubbed it across the skin to collect the bacteria that were living on the skin. And we can take this swab and extract the DNA from the bacteria and use the code in the DNA to work out the names of, of the bacteria that were living on the frog. And when we did this, we found that the enclosure did indeed affect the type of bacterial community that was living on the skin. So in the simple enclosure, we got a more simple, less diverse bacterial community on the frog skin. And then in the complex enclosure, a more complex bacterial community made up of more species. What wasn't necessarily so intuitive was the effect that this difference in my microbial community would have on the survival in the face of exposure to the virus. And this plot summarizes what we saw. So again, it's a survival plot. And animals were challenged with the virus. And this continuous line shows how the animals from the more complex enclosure with the more diverse microbial community on their skin fared in response to the, the virus. And then the dashed line below shows the simple bacterial community on the skin. And these animals survived less well. And we went looking for these kind of patterns in the wild also. And so we revisited some of these ponds with a history of disease or disease-free populations. What we found there was that uh, in the disease-free populations, it was there that actually the frogs had the more diverse bacterial communities living on their skins. And in the populations with disease, we had this significantly lower diversity in the bacterial community. But when we looked at the actual numbers of bacteria, the, it was flipped around. So the animals from the disease site had actually more individual bacteria living on their skin than animals from the disease-free sites. So what's going on there looks something like this. Without the viral disease in these ponds, you've got a diverse bacterial community on the skin, 
And then in the ponds with a history of disease, you've got this population of bacteria where there's actually a higher abundance, but it's dominated by a particular, particular type. And we don't really understand what this means for disease yet, but it certainly looks interesting and we're keen to explore it further. Try and go quickly through some vir viral weapons. Um, so we've already seen one thing that, make, that might make a virus a good pathogen, and that's its ability to exploit a range of different hosts. And ranaviruses are not just restricted to amphibian hosts, they also can infect reptiles and fish too. So you've got this really incredible range of, of potential hosts. But more than that, um, these viruses have the capacity to jump hosts over time. And this is a diagram which summarizes the relationships between viruses. So much like your own family trees, we can go backwards along these branch, branches to find ancestors. And we can also use the information that we have about modern viruses. So here I'm showing you the hosts that we find these modern viruses in. We can use this information to go backwards in time and work out the, the hosts of an ancestral virus, which I'm showing here with these gray silhouettes. Um, and so here, this whole group, we infer that the ancestral host was a frog, whereas here, if we take a bigger group, the ancestral host is inferred to be a fish. So at some point in the past, there's been a jump where an infected fish has given rise to an infected amphibian here. And there are other, other places in, the, in this tree where we see this same kind of pattern of host jumping. Skip that last one. Um, finally, just quickly to tell you about how human behavior can impact on this disease. And so I've highlighted a few studies here. The first one is one of a number of studies from China, which has documented ranavirus infections in farmed animals, which were being farmed for food. Um, and that ties in nicely with this, this other study down here, which looked at amphibians which were entering the US at major ports of entry and found that ranavirus infections were quite common. And then finally, this study here where uh, juvenile salamanders were being used as bait by anglers, and this was shown to have helped spread this viral disease in North America. I've worked on this a little bit too, and what I'm showing you here is another one of these family trees. And here we've, I've used viral DNA sequences to compare UK viruses to each other and to other viruses from around the world. And so I found two groups of UK viruses, which are marked here by the green boxes. But then if we take this blue box, which encloses all the UK viruses, so both groups, we've also got viruses from China and North America. And if we go outside the blue box, we've got Again, Chinese viruses and Spanish, a Spanish virus. And so this is an incredible geographic spread of these closely related viruses. And it's unlikely that these, these viruses have got to all these places around the world through natural movements, either of the virus or their natural hosts. And given what I've just told you about humans, we can see that it's much more likely that this spread, this large geographical spread would have happened through human behavior. And I've, I showed you a mechanism by which that might, might have happened through this international trade in, in amphibians. I'm going to stop there and summarize what I've shown you today, which is that wildlife can be very badly affected by disease, that the environment uh, can influence disease outcomes, that there's an impressive array of weaponry used on both sides of this interaction, and that human behavior can contribute to the spread of wildlife diseases, but also that everyone can help drive scientific research through contributing their own observations to projects such as the Frog Mortality Project. Thank you very much for listening. I have many thank yous to different people who've played starring or supporting roles in, in the research that I've presented today, as well as my funders. And I'll leave you with these things if you, if you do want to get a bit more involved after the talk. Thank you very much.
So we've, um, we've got a, a time that you guys can ask the uh, speakers some questions if you have them. So um, five or ten minutes, I guess, before everyone needs to disperse. We've got um, a couple of microphones floating around the back of the room. So anybody got any questions that you'd like to ask? Yes, lady in the middle first. Discussed fresh water. Do you, does anybody, can anybody comment on what I'm finding on top, the surface of seawater on our beaches? Does anybody happen to know about these deposits and what the likelihood is for viral um, infiltration or anything? You know, anybody know anything about it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what, what you're seeing. I think uh, there's been some really strong studies which have shown that uh, stuff that we're putting in our sewage, including viruses that, that are infecting us, have been passing out in our, into our sewage and are infecting marine wildlife. So I think there's, there's definitely a problem about how we handle our waste. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure about specifically what it is you, you've been seeing. Well, just what, what one sees now on the surface of the sea, uh, algae and my experience, I don't remember, um, you know, looking back a few years, seeing what I'm seeing now. Um, yeah, I mean, a, a, an issue with pollution is that it creates these algal, algal blooms, right? So, yes, we, I mean, our waters are filthy, and uh, mm. the more that we can do to combat that. Is, are there any moves being made? I mean, are there any, you know... Is anybody doing anything about it? Because children are going into the sea and, you know. Um, it's, it's not an area that, that I have expertise, but I think British beaches, we're on the up, right? We get, we're cleaning up our beaches for sure. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, there was, um, there was a lady at the front here, and one, I'll come to the lady at the back in a moment. Um, I'm just thinking human population growth is obviously a factor um, compared with uh, lesser, you know, small, uh, lower growth uh, in, in olden days. But um, I'm wondering also the diseased animals uh, on death, their virus will thrive in the environment as well without being destroyed, presumably. And, and we'll cross, in fact, that way. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite... Yeah, when, when the uh, diseased frogs died, for instance, the virus will still persist in the environment, won't they? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so I think it's... And, and that will, in fact... It's, it's highly likely that amphibians scavenge on, on dead animals. And uh, there was a, a photo in my presentation of a, a snake which was feeding on diseased newts, which had died of a virus and probably, probably becoming infected in, by that route. Nice. <laughs> there, was a, there was a lady at the back. Did you still have a question? Um, so I'll come to you in a moment. Hiya. Yeah. Hiya. I had two. Um, one was, do you know sort of what the mechanisms are for the reasons why um, high microbial diversity is linked um, to the sort of situation that you're saying with the, with them um, being protected, <laughs> protected against in a way against the ranavirus, um, and then also what can people do in their own sort of ponds to increase microbial diversity if that's the kind of thing um, that can protect them? Yeah. Um, so the question was about how increasing microbial diversity might be of benefit to these frogs faced with infections. Um, and yeah, it's something we, we really don't understand a lot of yet. So the, it's very early days for this research. Um, and yeah, we've, we've really only identified that there can be an effect. And so it's something that we will look to drive, drive forwards. Um, what can people do in their own ponds? I think you know, we're a long way from being able to advise people to 
dumped some yackle into their pond um, to boost, boost their frogs. Um, you know, the one thing that my, my research has flagged up on that side is, I think, again, we need to do a bit more work to see whether um, these frogs can manage infections through their behavior. But, you know, there's a real possibility that in a few years' time, we might be able to recommend to people to increase the shading and the refuges around their ponds so that frog can go and have a nice, quiet sit down or we might generally keep the water temperature down. Um, and, you know, I think that's a, a real cause for optimism that in the future we might be able to do something like that. Uh, I'm sure someone's going to have a question, question for Rich has stood there, let my, off the hook so far, yes? No, mine is still on run of virus, I'm afraid. Oh, dear. I, I take <laughs> it, from, from what you say, I take it that all uh, the British species of newt are affected. Um, do you know, do you have any figures for the, the, the numbers of newts and how they've changed over the last 10, 20 years for the three different... Um, what we really find in the UK is that the, the common frog is the, the species that's mostly affected. So here we take submissions of amphibians that people find in their gardens. Um, you're actually sat next to the, the man who organizes that. And uh, yeah, most of the submissions are, are frogs. Um, and certainly most of the submissions that are infected with, with ranovirus are, are frogs. Um, so very, very occasionally we find other, other species infected in the UK. So there seems to be a degree of specialization, potentially, of the viruses that we find here for common frogs, which we don't see in that region that I showed you in Spain where everything's dying frequently. It's just that uh, we have a pond in the garden that has common newts and great crested newts, and, but the numbers appear to have been diminishing over the last 10 or 15 years. Now, whether it's viral infection, we haven't found any dead ones. We found lots that we thought were dead. You put them in the water and they swim off. But uh, um, I just wondered if, if it's been affecting Yeah, you. I mean, I think as far as I know, we don't really have good data on uh, the more common newts. So, you know, there's, this, there's a study I presented where we looked at populations that had been faced with ranovirus and those that hadn't. And it didn't seem like there was a any other factors driving declines in the frogs other than the populations that had ranovirus. And then the, last year there was a study published with, which looked at toads which are, have been in severe decline, but there's, a, there's a quite a bit of speculation about exactly what's causing that. Um, and so, yeah, I think the newts we just know a bit less about than the, the frogs and toads. Uh, so I'll come back to you in a second. So there's a gentleman just at the back there with his hand up. Yep. Thanks. Uh, this is a question for Richard. Um, <laughs> you gave uh, two um, interesting figures, uh, financial figures, I think it was, about uh, firstly the $200 billion, uh, if that was correct, but the value, putting behind the value of nature. And then at the end of the presentation, reference to the UNPRI regarding their, I think it was $59 trillion assets under management. Presumably these figures aren't directly comparable, but does it perhaps suggest that we are undervaluing nature even in those kind of assessments? Yes, I mean, so, so um, one, one side of it is just how, how do you do those valuations? So the 200 um, uh, million was, was in terms of um, just the value given to um, that particular service. So it's things like, you know, replacement value. If you weren't going to rely on these pollinators, what, what, uh, what other mechanisms would you have to put in place? How much would they cost? What, what would be the loss in, 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 in um, the, the cost of the crops and, and the like? Um, so that's just for one service, right? They, they add up as you, as you start doing analyses for, um, you know, coastal defences and, and all the other kinds of services. So there, are, there have been some huge global studies that have tried to add them all up. So I gave you one figure for pollination just to, as an example. The numbers that, when, it's, when they're added up, Bob Costanza did the famous study a few years ago that was, I think, published in Nature that kind of tried to add it up. And the numbers are many trillions and are comparable to the world GDP. Um, so, 
you know, the, the bottom line being that the services that are provided are not replaceable. They are absolutely fundamental to, 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 to the existence and, 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 and that of, of human societies. But another side of it in terms of, of, of the, the um, kind of um, cost of managing biodiversity better, which so the 59 trillion is in terms of the, the, the money that's in within these kind of um, the, the UN's um, sign, the, the hedge funds and the like that have signed up to manage uh, or, or to obey, if you like, the, the, the conventions. Those, those numbers in terms of comparing those to, say, how much it would take to conserve parks better, those figures are, have, have been done. And we, we're currently an order of magnitude lower than we need to be in terms of just managing, say, parks better. So I, I haven't got the numbers to... to to hand, but if, in terms of, and, and studies have been done um, recently in terms of, you know, just how much would it cost? We've got this, I showed the increase in the protected areas. How much would it cost to actually manage those protected areas properly? Um, put guards on and, and, you know, do all the other things that, that are needed to actually make them more than paper parks. And the numbers are then in the trillions that, you know, are comparable with these trillions that are being invested and are comparable with the bailout for the US economy in, you know, in, in, 10 years ago and things like that. So we're an order of, I think the bottom line of what I'm saying and, and, is we're an order of magnitude low in terms of our investment in conserving biodiversity. But if, I guess the argument is, well, if we up it, then we can actually have a, an effect. So, yeah. Thanks. Hang on a minute, I've got one question in the middle. A uh, lady over here and then a guy at the back and then we probably need to wind that up because we'll be getting on towards time. So I'll tell you what, while the mic comes to you, shall we do yours? Have you, has your mic gone now? It's fine. Bring it to this guy first. Sorry, I'm just making things confusing. Thank you. Um, no, another one for Richard. Um, uh, one hears about, occasionally about, about projects that involve sort of cryogenic treatment of of DNA of various species just to guard against their, their extinction. Is that, is, how, how realistic is that? Is that, is that a, serious, a, a serious route that might be of some help or is it just you know, sort of a clever trick that so, you know, some mad scientist wants to, wants to try out for their own curiosity? Scientists are often a bit mad. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, you're in the kind of Jurassic Park type area here in terms of you know resurrecting species from from their dna there is a whole field of research on de-extinction would be the kind of name um that you know there are lots of youtube videos and, and lots of literature on it so it's not crazy 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 um i think the technology is potentially out there i'm no expert in this it's more than kind of total science fiction but it's some way down the road and I think most of us in, in, in my kind of area would argue that putting any kind of faith, if you like, in those kinds of technologies being the answer to the kind of biodiversity crisis that we have now is, is um, uh, ambitious or maybe foolish. But um, uh, it, I mean, it, it's not my area of expertise, but de-extinction would be the thing to look up as, as the kind of technical term. It's, it's not just... Um, Jurassic Park science fiction, you know, there's a lot of serious study in that area. Uh, just a, a quick comment on that. There's a really nice book called How to Clone a Mammal, uh, Mammoth, yeah. if you've ever seen it. But by it, it tells you all about the kind of, it's a nice popular read of the underlying science. Uh, there is some kind Beth of... Shapiro. Yeah, there's, there is some, yeah, quite far-fetched stuff in this and some quite feasible stuff in it. So if you're interested, I'd read that book. It's a really nice book. It's a really nice book that gets you a, a kind of lay introduction to that stuff. Yep. This lady, sorry, you had a question. Yep. Yes, it, it's again for Richard, and it was about the space required for biodiversity, actually, because I know there is a, a lot of investment into marine parks, and, but is there a, a, there's a magical number that some people seem to say, saying we need 50% of the planet for the other animals. Is that true? And if so, how can we help promote that? So, yeah, so... so Space for nature is one, is one of the biggies, and the, the big thing being pushed is 50% or half Earth is, is something to look up. E.O. Wilson, of course, the, 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 the you know, number one guy, if you like, in, in this whole area is really pushing this idea. It's a nice round number, isn't it? Half Earth. Um, of course, the science behind it is um, we need as much space for, the, you know, for, for nature as possible. I think the science is 
cases trying to be built, but you know, 50% is, is a bit of a, a, a nice round number. Um, a, a comparison is, is that in the, um, in, in the um, a lot of the conventions and, and like CBD, like the Convention on Biological Diversity, actually the Aichi targets, 17% is the target there. Um, which often people say, well, why, you know, why 17%? What's the big scientific reason that it's 17, you know, not 16 or 18? And the actual answer is that in the big UN conference at the time, there was debate, should it be 15 or 20? And the thing that they could agree on was 17. So it's a bit of a flippant way of saying, you know, the big round numbers, there isn't, you know, exact science that we can say, you need 17, you need 25, you need 50. Um, but what we do know is that we need space for nature. The kind of debate that's going on in this field is, is should we, you know, put 50% of the earth aside for nature and then we'll have the other 50%? And that's kind of this half earth kind of argument. Or should we have a much more nuanced um, land kind of sharing type approach where we actually integrate much better into the ecological system? And definitely I fall more within the latter. I think that just putting parks aside and making them, that's that intrinsic value, that's nature and this is us, is philosophically and morally the, the wrong argument, regardless of, of the science. I think that that intrinsic value, put nature over there, is, is not the way that we're going to kind of uh, address the issue. But um, yeah, th those are exactly the kinds of big questions that are out there being, being discussed at the moment. A bit conscious of time. Um, I'm probably going to need to give somebody else a, a go. Was there's a lady with a hand up here? There's a cheeky yeah. follow-on. Go on. To what okay. You, what you just said. Good. Um, and it's just to ask you: Do you trust us as humans to actually do the right thing when sharing space with nature? I mean, I think that's one of the. Sorry, I don't know if everyone can hear me. Um, I think that might be one of the concerns that lots of people do have about taking that approach. Yeah, so I don't have some scientific knowledge that can answer that with anything other than a personal opinion, but my opinion on that would be that we will, I trust humanity to do the right thing if it's our interests that are at the core of it. I don't if we say, oh, intrinsic value, let's put that to the side, that's, that's nature's worry and we'll give them some space and then this is our thing going on here. I think that's a fundamental point I'm trying to make. I trust us to do the right thing when we put our needs at the centre of why we should be conserving biodiversity. Um, does that half answer your, I mean, what's your opinion? Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's... No, but I'm looking at your slide with the loggers and the owls. Yeah. And there are always going to be human economic drivers and needs. And so that's, that's sort of where I'm coming from with the question, which is when confronted with, um, when confronted with resources, natural resources, there are always, in my view, going to be people who want to capitalise on them, even when, as a human society, it would be in our general interests to conserve and preserve. Yeah, so, um, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that, that's kind of the big question that's out there, and I think the argument that, that I've made in, you know, today and in, and in writing as, as well, and we work on, is that we need a balanced approach to that. You know, we, we, we do need to have the put space aside for nature, it's the regulation, it's putting laws of, around, you know, protected areas. You, you can't, whether you call it intrinsic value, but you can't destroy this forest, this ancient forest. You can't do this. That's the, you know, nature for itself type argument. Um, but that we should not use that at the total expense of the economic arguments when they are valid and that there are good, we think of the ecosystem services that are provided. We, we, we kind of need both sets of tools, if you like. You know, we need the regulatory side, but we do need the economic side. And, you know, there's a, there's, this comes from a background of a big divide in our field in terms of this idea of one versus the other. You're either just for nature for itself. Now, you just can't damage nature. Or, um, now we get all these services, we need to value them in, and include those in, in, in decision making. And clearly, we, I mean, we need, we need both. I think I'm going to have to draw the questions and answer session to an end there because of time. Uh, before we go, can we just say thank you very much to both Stephen and Richard for a great couple of talks, but also very thought-provoking and, and kind of interesting topics. So just thank you very much, guys. Thank you for coming. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.